Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance, as usual, and it is a dark and stormy night here where I'm coming from. Maybe metaphorically, the world could be thinking, uh, we could be thinking that it's a kind of a dark and stormy spot for sure. But today we've got Paul Linda, also known as Paul Luminari, to light up these dark spots in our perception and bring clarity to the events we see unfolding around us and our paths forward as the hyper lame mainstream media is constantly trying to remind us that there's only one way out of any particular fear porn that they're selling. The fact is that when we work through love, our potential is limitless and we have infinite choices and infinite free will and infinite possibility. The trick is aligning our wishes with that of our highest self so that every step that we fulfill along our hero's journey is one that is returning us to selfhood instead of robbing us of it. Like so many of the dreams that we've been sold and attempted to pursue from this culture. So this is going to be a super good episode. Paul's coming to us from Laos, still out there, been, been out there for quite a while now. And he even dreamed about this episode before we got on the air here to start talking. Also, like I said, it's storming here. So if you hear a little rumble in my microphone, think nothing, think nothing of it. Uh, it's just the way it's got to be because we have a 12 hour time difference and the only way it lines up for us is early in the morning for one and late at night for the other. So very interesting yin and yang. We're on opposite sides of at least the time zones. And because we're going to be talking about the darker side of things like the cryptocurrency rollout and mass adoption, and then phrasing that in a new direction with some of the possibilities and projects that Paul's been working on as solutions or been involved with, it's going to be quite a ride, this one. So to start things out, uh, before I, well, we'll let Paul introduce himself, but we're going to start out the episode with a little bit of psychic astral protection because I think both of us inferred that maybe like the weird AI demon uh, predator energy caught on to what we're about to do here. So <laughs> let's get into it. All right, Paul, welcome to the show. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me back, Chance. And yeah, I think it's always a good idea, especially. Because sometimes when we're discussing topics like this, it does send out a homing beacon and you want to make sure you have no points of entry. And usually these points of entry, you will hear them or feel them on your right side. I like to say the left side is the right side. The, the left side is the light side. The right side is the night side. And so, that has to do with brain hemisphere too, right? How the left and the right kind of switch between the external and the internal. Yeah, 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 exactly. So let's just start off with a demonstration of that. And also it's going to help protect us right now. Just you can close your eyes or don't, but I always find it easier to block out the visual senses for this. And just imagine a dome of electric violet light just start coming down around you into an egg form around your bioplasmic field. And you can also, once you've done that and you see the, the electric violet light almost kind of like being liquid light, liquid water, and below you, open up as if those giant spotlights, those classic spotlights you see, and just put it under you. But instead of the regular light that comes out of them, imagine it's electric blue violet light and just shooting a cannon of this light through your entire body. You can add in some sound effects if you like to really like up, up it up. And just do that for a few seconds and you should be good. And you can then open your eyes after you're done with that or keep them close and say, I am loved and I am worthy. I am safe and I am free. I am powerfully protected. I am master of my body and ruler of my mind. And do this in three, uh, in a set of three. So I am loved and I'm worthy. I am safe and I am free. I am master of my body and rule of my mind. I am loved and I am worthy. I am safe and I am free. 
I'm powerfully protected. I am the master of my body and the rule of my mind. I forgot to say powerfully protected that second time. So I should say that again. I am powerfully protected. Okay. And then you're complete and you can continue on with whatever you were doing. Short and sweet, activating that imaginary force field. Imaginary, not as in fictional, but energetic source force field, a source field. <laughs> cool, man. Well, so how's it going out there in the uh, faraway land? It's, you know, it's everything is a fractal expression of everything else. So I'm in a fractal that's, you know, not as loud as some other places in the world right now. Um, more intense places, but you know, it's, it's it's also still reflecting to a degree. But my personal experience has been a very good one overall, and I do attribute that to minimally engaging with what is happening and really focusing on staying embodied, doing the inner work, and being a conscious creator of things that I want to see in myself in the world, rather than focusing on all of the things that I seemingly have little power to change. So that has been very helpful for me. And I haven't really been psychically attacked in the past year much at all. So I believe that's the, the secret sauce to, to staying protected and to manifesting what you want to see. Yeah, the, the uh, psychic attack thing's interesting because I can't think of a time for a very long time that I at least noticed a psychic attack. And right before we were talking, I had this weird sharp pain just it felt like a dart hit me in the side of the head on the right side and I was like this is only I've only ever experienced that once before and it was when I was in the vicinity of uh practicing the energy vampire occultist who wasn't trying to harm me so much as just like let me know that <laughs> he could do this type of stuff and almost in a pranksterish way but it felt the same way like a a dart in the head but on the inside of the head so very interesting. And I think that now more than ever, we need to realize that the psychic vampirism is is on a group level, not typically on one on one levels anymore. It's group dynamics and that even just the mass harvesting of fear energy that goes on in the astral realm from every news drop of the next thing that's going to kill you out of nowhere with no control or consent from you is just like that's a way more profitable uh situation right now than anything else that they've ever had going so to me it seems like part of the gig is just to like perpetuate and uh keep the energy harvesting going long enough for the next wave of control mechanisms to be adopted and they're quickly being implemented and adopted i was just listening to a very good episode of a new episode of the higher side chats with allison mcdowell who has done tons of work on the blockchain, digital economy, and internet of bodies, hyper reality. And so to frame things in this conversation, at least from my end, I've started to call what we see the digital ecosystem and our ghost within it as a metaverse. Like the matrix is a metaverse. It's made of metadata, data that is increasingly more complex with very, more and more dimensions of information being tagged and timestamped in a specific point. And blockchain technology, when it's going to, when it's implemented by governments, is going to be a huge step in layering that system of meta information to leverage information about people that they have no idea that they could, <laughs> they could be predicted, right? Like there's very strange things in the fractal of this universe, such as statisticians who were researching the amount of roadkill, this is like an example that I'm sort of making up, sort of paraphrasing, but things like this happen. Uh, they'll, they'll notice that there's a fractal pattern 
to roadkill appearance along a certain stretch of highway that is like a numerically consistent in other places type of uh, what you call it an equation that could be derived. And there's examples of this sort of numeric patterning uh, metadata <laughs> system already going on through the Akashic where it's like part of the universal system of balancing everything. But what we have is this artificial balance coming through artificial life at this point. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point that you brought up. And the, the more conscious that people get, which sometimes seems like a tall order, but uh, the, the more conscious they get, the more they can realize that there is a artificial imposition being attempted uh, to be layered onto their reality. And if they are unaware that that is happening, then they're going to be tacitly agreeing to it and accepting it by way of being unaware and easily swayed, manipulated, and directed. So that really is the key. And I do believe that over the past year or so, there have been there has been a significant acceleration of how many people have realized that they have been manipulated and um, tacitly agreeing to creating this sort of synthetic uh, controlling reality that they would consciously not want to be a part of because who really truly wants to be controlled? Nobody's going to tell you, oh, I want to be controlled. It's just they are unconscious and it's just happening by way of that. So I, I, do, I do like that to see that trend. Uh, is it happening quick enough? Well, to my standards, no, but I, I, I accept everybody's um, path being different and them making their choices unconscious or not. And I just always tether to the reality of the Tao being, you know, the truth of reality and everything is happening as it should and it will unfold i believe everything will rebalance itself ultimately you know whether that's you know soon or or not soon it doesn't really matter because i see myself i see everybody as infinite beings completely immortal beyond this three-dimensional matrix so uh i'm not that concerned about it but i do believe that we are here physically in these avatars to change things more directly than we are perhaps uh, able to outside of this dense reality. And so the more people that do become quote unquote awake in this life, and the more that we band together to change the fabric of this density, the better things will be, I think, for everybody, not only here, but, you know, multidimensionally, because I believe there are karmic ties that we have between past, present and future versions of ourselves, of others. And it's all it's all a elaborate and elegant interplay that everything is affecting everything else. So that's why I'm still here. I'm still rooting for consciousness shifting on a global scale, or at least enough where you get that quantum leap where then everybody else who's more like in the middle and like a leaf being blown to and fro, they'll see, oh, this is the dominant energy and consciousness. And I'm just going to go with that because I go with whatever is the dominant energy. And this whole topic has just spun me into a lot of <laughs> thoughts about the fractal of things. And it's interesting that we've gone in that direction, or at least that that's got on my mind, because I think it's always the most pertinent perspective that you could pick up on. And when we talk about the technocracy, the next layer of control of society being something coming through, these uh, digital ecosystems and the internet of things and the internet of bodies and just the deadly orgone radiation networks in the air that are carrying frequencies of parasitic nature to and from, like we have the power to 
shield ourselves from that like we just did already right off the bat. But I also wonder if, well, let me do some more explaining and reframing here. There's a concept that's bandied about by some of these tech corporations that are deep into the AI research and the transhuman thing, religion, cult, I guess. I'm not sure. And there's a desire to create some, some form of avatar, if you will, of yourself that lives in the digital ether that will become autonomous and act on your behalf. Kind of like literally an artificial intelligence twin of you. And since it has all the metadata of everything you've ever chosen or said or done, the uh, theory is that you'd be able to create this thing that would be literally a digital you and would do only what you would have done in the digital arena. And somehow that's gonna be profitable to us as beings to have these digital twins. And to a degree, we already have these digital twins. It's the corporate straw man, all capital letters name. It started off on paper. Now it's in a even further reduced dimensionality in a sense or multiple reality dimensionality by going into the air or the zero or the ether. Uh, so we've gone from on paper digital identity to etheric digital identity and potentially the complexity of this digital identity is going to increase greatly. Whereas it started out as like a cartoon that was your bank account and a timestamp of when you did this and maybe some GPS tracking data of where you drove around. But at the point we're at now, it's like everything you say, everything that you watch or everything that you search, all the interactions that you have with other people. So where this could go on, on a fractal perspective is, is it possible that if that type of uh, project was continued forward, or maybe it's already there, that there is some form of conscious life to these digital identities of ours as an egregore, as a tulpa, as something that is physical energy in a closed circuit loop system. Like to me, energy and consciousness are the same and it's just different ways of looking at it. And the more energy that you have physically, the more consciousness you have. It just seems to me like that there's a, about a one-to-one -one correlation there. So is this future, transhuman future, a type of recreating of the world or the cosmos or this system of incarnation? Is this what we're all in already? Is a <laughs> some sort of lowered version from a higher self that created the human experience as sort of a digital avatar to get shit done for it? <laughs> is that all too far out? <laughs> Nothing is too far out. Um, I, the way that I see it and understand it is that everything, the, the base reality is rather than being a one, uh, a one dimensional reality is a, a very high dimensional reality, a very subtle and abstract and um, hard to understand reality from our position of awareness, but everything then transposes down into denser and denser density. And then there's almost like copies of it and reflective copies of it to a degree. And that's what we see here. We see we're like at the end of it almost. And we're at this really dense reality where it becomes very easy now to create a even less real reality because this, this 3D is also not even real, so to speak, either with, with matter just being empty space held together by invisible force. And the synthetic reality is just simply... The ability for us now, even people like you and me, if we had access to the technology to create basically our version of the Sims. And if anybody wants to upload a copy of their ego personality in the state that it is at this very moment, and it wouldn't, it'd be static, it wouldn't be growing, you wouldn't be growing in, in a synthetic reality, then you have that ability to do that, especially the more that computing advances with quantum computing being on the horizon, if not here already. But it's such a, it's such a quote unquote basic reality where 
it would just be a ego copy of yourself. You could never be within that synthetic reality from how I see it. It would just be a copy of your personality at that point. And you wouldn't actually find it that enjoyable unless you're fine living a very basic life, which I think most people aren't, even though some of them do it because they feel they need to. Uh, they don't have time to spend on higher consciousness pursuits because they're taking care of basic needs, which is by design, focus all your energy on just survival mode. Well, I think it's even so, more insidious now that it's been a continuing, a continuing buildup of making it uncomfortable to be in the body so that, yeah, maybe you can't project your consciousness into the computer and live in there, but the way that people have advanced from black and white, from radio to black and white TVs to now full on VR headsets, you in a way are projecting yourself into that artificial world, the more hypnotically entranced into it you are. And the more your body is uncomfortable to be in, the more of a lure that attention sucking device has. Yeah, definitely. And anybody who saw Ready Player One knows that it's at best, it's a momentary escape, but you still are going to have to come out into this reality and see and deal with things and and see that it's not it's not going to improve your state of being as much as you believe it will even if to the point where it becomes you're just jacked in like in the matrix you're still you're, 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 you're living a shadow of what you can experience and within this enclosed reality that somebody else made and you do not have the free will like you do here because you agreed to give it away. And I'm sure there's going to be terms of service that are very lengthy that are going to spell out things like that. And it, again, it always comes back. I strongly believe that you cannot be forced to do anything that you did not somehow agree to, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. And people are unconscious a lot. And so it seems like something is being forced on people, but there's, it's so easy for a point of entry to occur in, in, in this reality. It's very delicate like that. So it just always comes back to increasing your lucidity and using all the tools at your disposal to, to do so. Agree, very much agree. Uh, lucidity, clarity, these are things that actually strengthen the field because it's really awareness that is the highest form of self-defense, whether psychic or physical. If you're too busy with your fondle slab to notice a mountain lion on the trail, you know, that's, uh, you didn't, you weren't able to defend yourself because it's, you didn't have the attention energy. So yeah, getting real clear about where we are, one of the things that can help in terms of getting clear is knowing that freedom or free will is also synonymous with spirit or life or the Tao, whatever version of a descriptor you want to put on the one continually unfolding process of unified everything. <laughs> and so what we are seeing with uh, people who don't believe they have free will anymore is a confinement of choices down to like, oh, I'll lose my job if I don't get a dart, a poison dart, things like that. And the light or life because it's synonymous with free will or the spiritual underpinnings of all things are freedom will always give you the opportunity to make any choice outside of a binary that has been presented to you as a, an absolute binary. There's always something else. Exactly. And to your point, when somebody, and this is happening a lot, it seems is like, Oh, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to lose my job. So I'm going to agree to give away my power and have somebody do something abusive to me because I'm afraid I'm going to lose something, but you can reframe it and you can see it as thank you for making it very clear to me that I'm not aligned with this job so that 
I can find something that I am more aligned with. And that's actually going to bring me more abundance, success and prosperity and joy. Right. And the thing that puts all that pressure is in the form of financial pressure, right? We have all these deadlines that are on the bills that are worshiped by us <laughs> deadlines in the form of writing and, and very fraudulent contracts that we don't realize are fraudulent. When we enter into them for things like credit card debt or any number of issues that people would be afraid to leave a job because they don't know how they're going to make that payment. I mean, payment. <laughs> so with the, cryptocurrency mass adoption happening right now, a lot of people have been able to use that system to, as a backup plan to get themselves out of the fire or off the frying pan, so to speak. The, there's a lot of issues with the system of cryptocurrency though. In, a, in many senses, it's a lot like a casino for uh, people to as sort of prop like when one rises, someone else loses. It's very much a further abstraction of the stock market. And with the further the gamification of society, I think has been slowly building on. And we probably first saw the concept of video game money, if you will, as the a lay laying down the steps and foundations for getting people to believe in fully etheric digital currencies. And we can be as uh, against it in conceptualization as we want. Like maybe we think money is not worth existing, or we think because there's so much of a push for adoption by technocratic elites towards the blockchain, which in itself, the words blockchain and crypto have difficult anonymic readings, if you will. Uh, and I've gone into that before, but the fact remains that there's also a path forward with this type of technology if we remain clear about what it is and what we're using it for. Because at the end of the day, society is a game, a set of rules agreed upon. And perhaps we will now, we'll, we, we can use crypto without believing that it's something substantial or that will save your life in an emergency. But as a, we could even give it a better word than crypto. But I want to get into your I'm kind of going on too much here. I want to get into your thoughts on some of the pitfalls because you have a lot of experience in this and a deep background in it. And we'll go from there to some of the solutions that you've been working on, but we can spend plenty of time lining out the things people should be aware of as mass adoption continues to uh, astronomically rise, really. I have been following cryptocurrency since almost the beginning. And I believe I heard, first heard about it in 2010 or 11. And I, it came out in 2009, early 2009. It was developed in 2008. Used some previous technologies like Hashcash. And there was another version of, of digital money that also existed. And... So since the 90s, there has been a cypherpunk movement, as they called them. These sort of anarchist-minded uh, programmers who saw, especially in like since 9/11, with the whole thing that happened with the police state and the financial collapse in 2008, all those orchestrated events they saw that there is an increasing amount of control and tyranny being imposed on humanity. And they wanted to do something about it through the means of technology, freedom through technology, even though uh, I understand that it's, it still is limiting overall, but for the times it, it does provide a little bit more freedom if used correctly. So it I'll just interject like a short interjection that technology etymologically means art. And so art can be either in alignment and harmony with natural processes in the world or not. And so even if it's an electronic form of art technology, it doesn't preclude that from being something that was in alignment with nature and actually benefits the process of life and the flow of the Tao. Right, exactly. And it's interesting how this 
completely synthetic uh, technological world that we are able to speak as as a as a benefit of uh, across the world, it all was created out of natural elements on the earth, you know? So it's, it's very interesting. It does have a source in organic technology, if you look at it that way. But anyway, the Bitcoin was, when you look at the original paper of Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonym of the creator of Bitcoin, it says it's supposed to be a anonymous peer-to-peer currency, digital currency. And now that has definitely changed, but the, the original premise was that to basically decentralize the financial matrix to have direct peer-to-peer uh, exchanges of commerce and beyond because the blockchain technology and cryptocurrency can be used for a lot more than just uh, buying and selling things. And it's called cryptocurrency because of cryptography being a, a means of, of protecting and securing the network so that people don't know what is being sent or who is sending it. Even though Bitcoin itself is pseudo-anonymous, it's not like Monero, which is very anonymous. But yeah, so that's, and I believe it's unfortunate that's called cryptography because of the word crypt, but um that's because of the cryptography technology and the blockchain, which is the technology that everything is recorded onto is this ledger. And you can, you can always know that nothing is able to be changed. So it's a very accurate display. So that means when you're peer to peer, you're, you, you don't need to necessarily uh, trust someone that much or worried that they're going to be shysty and, and do something like a bad actor would because the blockchain never lies. You can go and see that everything is accurate. And uh, of course the blockchain as well, I don't prefer that term as well because it's like chains, like you're, you're in this, this chain of blocks, but it's just called that because of these uh, uh, pieces of data that are all tied to one another. But originally the, the, the focus of the technology was to liberate humanity in a way from the centralized financial power structure. And at first it, I saw it was really doing that. You had things like the Silk Road, which were completely unfettered uh, commerce going on between people uh, no matter what you wanted to buy or sell, you can do it with just a simple agreement with someone else. And obviously because of the nature of the Silk Road, it brought upon increasing scrutiny and the CIA wanted to have a meeting with, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto and I believe Gavin Anderson, who were the core developers of Bitcoin at the time. And that spooked Satoshi and he never really got involved in the project again after that. And also because he saw that WikiLeaks was getting pressured because they were accepting Bitcoin. So he, by pressured by the government. So he kind of went on to do other things and whether or not he continued in the vision is hard to say or what happened, but other projects sprang out from it that realized Bitcoin is kind of going the wrong direction where it's stalling. And we still believe in this decentralizing of the financial structure because we understand that you control people the best with their finances because they need money on this planet to survive. We are the only species that lives on this planet that needs to pay to live basically in most places. This is like here where I live. You, you don't need money. If you really wanted to, to go at it, you can just go in the jungle and there's just, you know, fruit trees and, and tubers growing everywhere. You can just build your house out of everything around you. No one's going to bother you. But in most places, you do need to have money to live. So that is an easy way to control people. And they wanted to make sure that there is as little control as possible in that regard. And people can create 
their own destiny financially wise by having these peer to peer transactions. And Monero is one that is a very popular one that sprung up that is, I believe, in the original vision, but even takes it further instead of having pseudo anonymous transactions. They're as anonymous as you can get them while still having a, a cryptocurrency. And then another one that's still being in development. Uh, well, it's actually not, it's already developed, but it's being upgraded in a major way this year is called Nexus. And that is the project that I'm involved in that has a very conscious development team, the most conscious that I found in anywhere in the cryptocurrency sphere that I've known about since 2017, which has attracted me to them. And they understand the pitfalls of, the, of technology, of blockchain technology, which can you know, ultimately enslave humanity way more than it is even right now if it's more centralized like is being promoted with uh, by certain factions and organizations, but it can also be used as a tool to liberate humanity, at least temporarily. And I view as a, you view it as a bridge to a better world. But ultimately, I think we will transcend blockchain technology, cryptocurrency as well, because I don't think it's the end all be all. I believe the end all be all is to do everything through our consciousness and our minds become fully telepathic, not need to have so much uh, constraints on the physical or requirements to sustain the physical body and the physical reality. I believe there's there's a, a much more that we can do, like super mentalizing the being, super mentalizing the, the reality we experience, like Sri Aurobindo talks about. But I understand also that that could be well far into the future. It's time will tell. But yeah, uh, I know I went on there, but basically the technology did start, I believe, with humble beginnings and a optimistic view of how it can help liberate humanity. But in more recent years, especially in this past year, it has kind of come to a fork in the road. And now it seems like there's going to be two blockchain futures, one that is century con controlled by the you will own nothing and be happy crowd. And then the other one that is decentralized anarchist and distributed and sort of uh, kind of like the wild west, but also very liberating for humanity. So it is up to us and up to these projects to decide what sort of digital future do we want to uh, tether to this physical reality as a bridge to a better reality. Wow. Yeah. There's so much to it, <laughs> what you just laid down. And yeah, I've not ever had anyone explain the sort of mythos of Satoshi Nakamoto before on the air, but that's one that I'm skeptical of as a controlled op story. I mean, I put a lot of value into the word magic side of things, the green language. And the last time I did green language on that name, I came up with a meaning sort of like central intelligence as uh, I, I can't recall exactly because the etymology of Japanese is different for me, but I mean, I don't have that memorized, but that doesn't take away anything. Like this isn't a shooting down of the concept. It's just that I think anytime that there's a big change on the horizon, the controllers have seen it six ways from Sunday, either watching the sky clock, you know, they know it's coming or they seeded it in the first place, whatever the case may be, or they just knew it would be a natural progression of people trying to find a way around the different constrictions they're putting on the free flow of energy and life, <laughs> life force. So that, that all being said, like, even if there was, even if Satoshi was nothing other than a, fictional pseudonym from central intelligence, the programmers around the world that have put a lot of time and effort into trying to think of ways to do this, to remove the parasitic middlemen from commerce transactions, free the, <laughs> free the entire scene from all the different weird bands and restrictions. And the fact that a lot of stuff that we depend on has to come through big multinational corporations is the biggest factor for why we're stuck in their particular system of commerce. Like 
they can they control the means of production as the <laughs> communists might say and i do think that there's a communist side and a anarchist side to the potentials of this type of digital currency because if it was done right and it was decentralized and there were many different options and different communities had their own currency system i think that does spell freedom the whole point is that you should be able to do it the way you want to do it with the people that you want to do it with right and so we just have to uh, be aware of the fact that there's going to be like a very honeyed fly trap waiting for many different avenues that you could go with crypto investment like you might think that you just made a whole bunch off of uh pulling some profits out and not realize a, a year two three later that the irs actually knew about that <laughs> like there's a lot of sticky places where the thieves can come back in and try to put the pressure on us so i think that if we are getting into this stuff even if you feel like maybe you want to bet on XRP because of the Palantir, Peter Thiel backing, you still have to put some energy and attention, probably more, into solutions that you've researched, you've connected with, you see as a, a better option. And be very aware that things can be co-opted even later that started out with good intentions and never be satisfied by taking a word from a particular group or a mission statement, unless you have some per personal firsthand knowledge of why that would be accurate or a working knowledge of the system as they describe it, that you can look at and see and know for sure. And that makes it all kind of complicated and where it's useful to have programmers like yourself to help guide us through some of the options that are better for us. And there's a, I want to stay on this vein of, of digital currencies, maybe talk about like, exchanges the best way to go about trading or converting into fiat or whatever that could be more private that aren't the the big corporate options but i also wanted to back up a little bit and ask you what does that term super mentalize mean when you refer to us taking on our higher potential of psychic powers and complete mental interconnectivity without the need for devices. So in a nutshell, supermentalization or supermental transformation is not necessarily a prerequisite for enlightenment, but it's a process that we can go to by literally becoming, by becoming very, very conscious we become very lucid and aware of how much, I would say, influence we have over this three-dimensional avatar that we're using temporarily and actually consciously control it almost down to the molecular level, well, down to the molecular level and accelerate the spin of all the fields that are contained within all those molecules and create it in a more subtle density to the point where we are not as dense and physical as we are. And also that's like the, the, the most extreme level to it, but also that all our extrasensory, what's called extrasensory perceptions, senses are fully online. It completely negates the need to have the internet any sort of technological interface, we are connected to the, the super mentalized organic version of that, the original that this is all a copy of, and directly experience life in a much more uh, supreme way and in direct way than this sort of uh, simpler version of that. And that is a future that I believe is possible, but it does require a lot of conscious intention and awareness. And there have been people, and there still are people who are able to supermentalize their beings. They're usually out in the East out here, and they they call things like the achieving the rainbow light body. And um, there's stories of people that 
are able to almost seemingly fly, but they're just basically jumping like hundreds of feet because they become much lighter in density. They're able to do all sorts of kinesis and really like have a very direct relationship with the manipulation of, of the, the elements. So that is super mental transformation in a nutshell. And if we do that collectively, the, their power completely disintegrates because what they have to offer us is pales into comparison what we have direct access to if we become super mentalized. Right. I think so to paraphrase or not reduce, but fully simply conceptualize what you're talking about. It's like removing all the filters of your perception that distract you from the immediate one-to-one -one connection between your thoughts and your physical body's feeling and what happens to you externally being all one big unified plucking of a string or a chord on the vibratory instrument of your soul <laughs> that it's the same in the fractal as how we have middlemen between us and all the resources we need for life that we also have filters installed by middlemen between the actual potential of life and reality and how we see it in our mind. So that's a very interesting thing. It's like another level of parasitic cleanse when you think about it, just to heal your worldview. I've always thought that the uh, healing of the worldview from a poisoned and limited and constricted one in a fearful one, essentially, is an essential and almost automatic way to bring about big healing changes in your body and opportunities in your life. I think that's what really gets poisoned by all the crazy onslaught of media. But, you know, in 90% of my dreams, I can jump like those Taoist wizards really far, almost to the point of flying. So I think I've got the hang of it. I'll be doing that here eventually. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> well, see, we've got about, I don't know, eight ish minutes. We don't have to be exact in the free hour. So where do you want to leave things and where are we going to lead things whenever we pick back up? All right. Yeah. So I, I did want to just say a couple more things about the potential positives of the technology because it is not going away. So we might as well use the and enhance the positive aspects of it. And like I was talking about the project that I'm a part of called Nexus, it is kind of future proofing itself because basically virtually all cryptocurrencies, all blockchain technologies are not quantum resistant. And there are quantum computers being developed that will be able to break all the cryptography of these, these blockchains. And they have developed a quantum resistant uh, component to their blockchain, which is a unique blockchain they built from the ground up to make sure that there's nothing you know, funky in it that they brought over from other blockchains. And that will allow them to be protected so that we can truly have a private and secure network and even a private and secure internet because Nexus is creating a decentralized internet that is using, this is going to be using technologies that are also um, controlled and owned by the people rather than centralized companies. So it's going to be a completely decentralized and peer to peer system that it cannot, you know, we're, we're going to be able to finally have a, a free and, and simple way and secure way to communicate with each other, do commerce, create all sorts of, of, of uh, use cases. And so that, that is what I would like to see more of. And, and also in the other project, because you know, it's, it's nice to see an entire ecosystem so that Nexus is not the only one out there doing this. And I think, like, like I said, Monero is doing that too. So there are positive developments and people, I believe, Rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater with like some people do, it's just like, oh, blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, it's all bad. It's all part of the, like, the control matrix. It's like, it's a technology and you can use it for good or for bad. It's 
what you decide to do and what you decide to support. We're using the internet. It was developed by the, the military, and yet it has helped awaken millions, hundreds of millions of people, potentially. So it's, it's, it's all about how you use the, the technology. It's, you can use it for dark magic. You can lose, use it for light magic. Yeah, the internet, just to have an IP address be uh, also connected to uh, like a web name, a domain name, that whole DNS system and architecture. I was just looking more into the origins of that the other day. And yeah, that's all DARPA created. That was just handed out all <laughs> across the West and over to, in Europe. And it was basically all laid down in a very short order and coming from a programming protocol straight out of the military industrial complex. So to think that that's not the exact place where any back doors would have been this <laughs> figured out way before things started would be silly. So to have a really airtight system outside of anything that the controllers could feasibly touch, it would make sense to have a decentralized different form of internet. But I wonder at the scope of that, does that require uh, alternate infrastructure or anything? Yes. Yes, it does. It requires alternate infrastructure and it could also require alternate energy systems like Tesla created. And, you know, there's Zenic waves that the earth releases naturally that you can also wield and utilize. And there's, you know, a, a less dirty form of wireless uh, electricity that you can use that Tesla was tapping into. And there are ways where you're completely, you have developed a, a framework, a technology from the ground up that is not possible to have back doors because you, you're not using anything that they're, they've created. And you're developing something that can actually be the, the freest sort of digital technology that you can create but it is meaning that you, you cannot rely on what they've created because then you're getting into an agreement that you can then have backdoors because you're using their system. And it's their system. That's fine. They can have their system and play with it. They have free will. But we have free will, and we could create our own system that's also designed how we want it to be, which is liberating. Yeah, and even the and thought... Go ahead. I'm just saying I have a, 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 a high-pitched tone in my left ear once I said that, and that is the light side, which is, I think, a good sign. Oh, yeah, I get those. It's just like someone comes up and rings a bell right next to my left ear. Cool. I'm into it. I actually, like, this, this conversation has helped me on some worldview healing with the potential because I hadn't really thought about the alternate infrastructure question, and it was almost like, other things that have been handed to us to take for granted from the parasite energy that we're supposed to never be able to do without like, well, it's either I have <laughs> this kind of a uh, cell phone device that they want you to have, or it's nothing, but there's like, we kind of started out saying there's always another way, another option. And it's getting even cheaper than ever to do things like 3d print. Maybe we could, see within the next 10 years a revolution where we have the ability to not just operate on alternate infrastructure but self-assemble that infrastructure anywhere and share the open source blueprint for that so you always know what's under the hood with the tech that you're tinkering with and that's also you know it might sound way too hard or difficult to the wrong person to conceptualize building their own Wi-Fi router or something that worked on alternate, uh, more clean bandwidth, so to speak. But it doesn't have to be. I mean, we're at the, we're really just at the limits of our, our will to know and to act. That's our main limitations. And sometimes that will can be compromised by uh, low energy and maybe to maybe for a time before this can really get swinging, we need to recuperate and disconnect and unplug. And we kind of, to some degree, are being forced to at least unplug from some of the social aspects of our life. So we're getting a warm up, a taste of, of that. But 
it's only as difficult as we make it in entering into the Aquarian age or deeper into it or however you want to conceptualize it. There is a Uranian freedom aspect, but also a technology novelty aspect. But I think that what one aspect of the energy of where we're moving into is that it's just getting simpler and easier where because we've put so much collective thought energy into this type of uh, technology, it's only getting simpler for someone new to jump into that neural pathway that others have been digging out for years and start out at a closer to the, uh, the edge, if you will. But yeah, we're getting pretty well to the end here. I <laughs> don't really like taking a break for a, a pause to go to the members only section because I don't like to interrupt the flow, but we got to do it. There's reciprocation required and it's been an awesome first free hour. I know it's going to just get deeper and more interesting and more solutions will be uncovered as we go into the second hour, but I won't make you cut yourself short. If you have more that you wanted to express in the first hour, let it rip. And then we'll move over. And thanks for asking to come back on and talk about these things. It's very, it's been a very learning oriented conversation for me. Yeah. Thanks chance. It's, it's always a pleasure to come on. And I did want to talk about the pros and cons of blockchain and cryptocurrency, because I see some people are very, very pro it and very, very anti it, but I've learned throughout this life and many others that nothing is black and white. It's many shades of gray, and it's really how you interact and engage with something and add your conscious creative energy that determines whether something is a positive or negative outcome, if you want to look at it in those terms. And I see the possibilities. I always see the possibilities in things. And I see the possibilities of this technology, not as the end-all be-all, but as a bridge to a better world. So I'm glad that I was able to share some of that while also acknowledging the very uh, controlling ways that the technology can be used. But that's like with everything that the what I call it the distortion does. They they look to see how they can control anything so that it would be natural that any sort of technology that would come up that would potentially liberate humanity, they would find a way to, on the other side of it, to use it to control people. So it is up to us to collectively agree and individually agree and choose technologies that can help liberate us and be that bridge to a more supermental future. Cool, man. All right. Well, we'll leave it for now and come back on the second hour for members on Patreon and Rockfin. You can catch that in the show description, links to all that if you don't know how to get there already. And Paul, thanks again. Looking forward to picking this up on the other side. Israel's putting into practice its plan to return to normality with schools and kindergartens beginning to open their doors. But concerns have been raised after the country's prime minister proposed a controversial measure to track children's social distancing by microchipping them. I spoke with our heads of technology in order to find measures Israel is good at, such as sensors. For instance, every person, every kid, I want it on kids first, would have a sensor that would sound an alarm when you get too close, like the ones on cars. So there's that. <laughs> Don't usually start an outro playing something from another source, but this came across my radar 
yesterday, I think. And I was like, wow, there it is. The thing that conspiracy theorists have always said. And it probably comes up and gets shot down over and over again, this idea of microchipping. But the agenda continues to move forward. And it seems like that particular country is really, really deeply entrenched in that agenda. So that was a clip from an RT report. And I know what RT is. It's not like I trust them as a news source, but all they're doing is showing what the prime minister says himself, unless they mistranslated that, (laughs) but it seemed pretty clear. So, right. Putting chips into kids. That's quite a downside of this technology that we're developing as a species. Anyway, let's back up and just say thanks to Paul for coming back on the show for a third round. There are a lot of good episodes in the archive, and two of them happen to be with Paul. So if you want to check those out, just go to my website, interversepodcast.com, and search Paul Linda, or just Paul. You'll probably find him that way. Really enjoyed this conversation. I've been very hard on the concept of digital currency and crypto, and I do respect the opinion that technology is a tool, and having a completely Luddite, doom and gloom, perspective on it with no consideration of positive use cases is a bit disingenuous. I mean, here we are on this technology right now, connecting with each other and doing something feasibly good for both of us, right? So that's why I wanted to make sure that we had this particular chat because I could talk to a lot of people about crypto, but Paul is somebody that's got a foot, one foot in the physical, technological, and the other foot in the spiritual, deeply rooted. And I respect his opinion a lot on things. I think he's got a great work ethic. He's an awesome writer. And it seems that for the whole time I've known him, he's been putting his efforts towards the liberation of humanity and the raising of consciousness and shifting our worldview into one where we can actually develop those supramental powers that he was talking about, which I think is a really cool concept. And I'm definitely not... (laughs) I'm not opposed to that as a concept. I mean, we have the so-called placebo and nocebo effect. Here's something that happened to me. The last couple of days, I've been, maybe three days, I've been drinking a decaf coffee, and I didn't know it. And I had no difference in terms of how it made me feel or the perception of being energized by it until the morning that I realized it was decaf, which was this morning. And then all of a sudden, I was tired because I didn't have my caffeine. So belief's a hell of a drug. (laughs) I always like to tell people, if I came to your house and said, tomorrow morning you're getting $20 billion or whatever, pick a number, but all you have to do is go to sleep tonight by 10 p.m. and stay asleep until, I don't know, 7 a.m. and no tossing and turning, I'm going to be checking to make sure that you're totally asleep. That'd be really hard because you'd be so energized. And I like that example because we're talking about currency there. For a lot of people... The Bitcoin roller coaster is like that. One night you'll go to bed thinking you're rich, and the next morning maybe everything looks really rough. And I enjoyed the advice that Paul gave about not selling out of fear and all that, but I still have a bad taste in my mouth about the whole casino gambling aspect of all these different ways of improving your financial situation by essentially rolling the dice and attempting to profit off of other people losing. And I know it's not usually framed that way, but I can't think of many examples where that's not the case, except for maybe if you are earning crypto in some kind of a way that doesn't necessarily require you to do the full trader life. And you just like, like me, look, here I go. I'm uh, excusing myself because on Rockfin, they just give me the crypto coin and at some point I'll sell it. Am I profiting off of fools by doing that? I don't know. (laughs) It's a really weird situation. I'm sure many of us have some degree of connection to this adaptation of digital currency that is happening so quickly. And like I said, I don't want to be a total Luddite about it. I want to look at it from both sides. So I'm glad that we got to have this conversation. Hope it wasn't obnoxious to hear a crypto conversation because some people just don't want to hear it. And I can understand that. But it is a huge part of the developing technocracy. And at the very least, we should be concerned with the potential downsides of this, like Israel putting microchips in children. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that I have on my mind from this conversation. I guess first I should let you guys know what was going on in the Plus extension. So if you're new around here, 
You can get the second hour of this conversation and all the other double long podcast interviews that I've done over the years, which there are many, many numerous episodes. So that whole archive can be accessible to you if you log on to rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N dot com forward slash interverse. Check the show description for a link or patreon dot com slash interverse. I kind of misadvertised that there. There's actually only the recent archives in Rockfin going back to 2020. And not all of 2020 is uploaded, but a lot of the best ones. No offense to anyone that hasn't seen their episode up yet. I'm just kind of loading them out of order. However, I feel like it, whatever feels appropriate. So Rockfin's got a lot of archives, plenty to keep yourself busy while you wait for the next new weekly episode. But Patreon does go back all the way to the beginning of when I started doing extensions, which is quite a long time ago. Patreon's five bucks a month, gets you all that. Rockfin's 10 a month, but on the upside with Rockfin, you get to unlock all of the extended exclusive content from the other creators on Rockfin, like Lindsay Sharman of Rogue Ways and Beth Martins of Beth Martins. <laughs> and who else is on there? Wayne McCroy. Going to be talking to Wayne McCroy soon. Alchemical Tech Revolution. He's got some exclusive Rockfin content going on now, which is pretty sweet. And that's going to be right on point with the conversation we had with Paul today, because with anyway, Wayne, we're going to be talking about transhumanism and the occult sciences, philosophies of how we got to this point of cybernetics, what cybernetics really is. And that's a wild thing because I never actually knew the full definition of cybernetics wasn't just about creating systems of interface between humans and machines, but it's actually about systems to control humans and machines. Actually, not just humans, any animals. So cybernetics includes any type of social engineering, even if it's just going on on the psychological realm, in my opinion, which is kind of a wild, especially because that's using technology to put the perspectives out there. That's kind of a wild thing to realize. The words always give it away, don't they? And it never fails to astound me when I look up a word and find all these crazy etymological connections that shed light on what it actually means or what the agenda is behind it. It's always been about the control of language. So I know I said I was going to tell you what was in the plus extension. Here I go. I'm really telling you now, at least a little bit of it. At the beginning of the second hour, I drew from the I Ching to see what would come up in the context of crypto digital currencies. And it gave me some very interesting results that led to insights about the nature of money and the age change from water to air and how that works with currency and what the dynamic and consciousness might end up being, let me just say, it's not going from better to worse. It's going from difficult to different type of difficulty, almost like a polarity shift of extreme lack to extreme overage, overload. Anyway, we'll get to that if you listen to hour two. We got into more of the pros and the cons of the concept of digital currency, of course, what to watch out for with decentralized exchanges, Questioning how private anything could really be and how to safeguard against those prying eyes of the feds and whoever else might be tracking your transactions. Probably every major corporation and government that exists at this point, all sharing. And that's just a few things that we talked about. Just a small taste. We're not going to spoil it all. But man, this is a uh, really weird stuff. And I just listened to an episode of the Higher Side Chats with Allison McDowell, and I think I brought this up in the first hour about, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but this concept of the digital twin, which is, I guess, a goal of the technocrats right now to have some sort of, if it doesn't already exist, artificial intelligent algorithm learning, machine learning thing in the digital ether that is your personal twin, almost like a upgrade in a dark way of the concept of personhood and your government identification and citizenship, all of that moving into a, from the two dimensional realm of on paper deeper into the etheric. I don't know. I guess that's two dimensional too, one dimensional, not physical, not real, very artificial. And so the idea would be that this digital twin could go out and do things on your behalf and it would make the choices you would make and, it would represent you and what it did would also count against you if it was bad. I don't know exactly how this is supposed to work, but it's like 
probably going to be sold on the basis of, oh, this thing will do your taxes for you or schedule your appointments for things that it knows that you need that are coming up or who knows, like an AI digital assistant. But that's just a slippery slope. I mean, we're already letting machines make decisions for us left and right. How much can we automate without losing what life is, which is making choices and acting on our (laughs) feelings about things? And sometimes that includes slogging through difficult paperwork from the state to keep yourself out of their clutches, I guess. Although there's ways out of that too. It's all consent-based. It's all farming your consent. And about this digital twin idea, why I bring it back up now is because I was checking out this game from 2017 called Mass Effect Andromeda. And it is a pale... Pale shade, <laughs> terrible comparison to the original Mass Effect trilogy, which was pretty cool and gave you plenty of like warning about AI being dangerous, I guess, like Terminator Skynet style. But in Andromeda, the human race and affiliated humanoid species from the fake galaxy, from fake other planets, all band together and make an amazing journey to another galaxy, a one way trip. Because mainly they want to go to a place where it's legal for them to use AI. And the whole premise of the plot has to do with the main character, which is the player, having an AI that's implanted into their nervous system and perceives the world through their senses and can talk to them in their head and make things happen in the digital space, like unlocking doors. And basically, I noticed that throughout the whole game, the main character is always just like, Hey, what do I do? Hey, what do I do? Hey, what do I do? And maybe it's not intentional by the programmers. Who knows? It's made by EA Games. If you know who EA is, <laughs> EA, from Sumerian mythology, right? And I'm getting, now I've got a link to Sumerian mythology. This is going to be a long outro. Oh, well. So, right. So this idea is already being seeded into pop culture left and right of how useful it's going to be when we merge our consciousness with an AI and it does our bidding and it helps us and it's really nice and it's really cool. This seems very much like a slippery slope because like I said, video I've said this in the past a million times, video games these days are all about the player being some kind of like mercenary that just does exactly what they're told and you follow very simple instructions and shiny arrows and golden paths to do what the game asks you to do and there's no like figuring stuff out or exploring If there is exploring, it's just really about like hoarder style collecting of random items scattered throughout the environment. It's really different than what games used to be like. It's just this strange loop of psychological, psychologically developed feedback loops. We'll talk about that with Wayne that basically farm, cause you to farm your own dopamine constantly taking a hit from all these little flashing upgrade bars and picking up rare items that aren't really rare at all. It's very bizarre. And it's definitely preparing people for a digital existence where your your inventory is mostly digital. <laughs> Own nothing and be happy, that type of thing, right? So now I'm going to go over to the Sumerian thing that I just brought up because you may be aware of at least the sort of pop culture conspiracy theory version of the Sumerian mythology that has to do with the gods creating humanity as a slave race to mine gold and mine other precious metals. Very interesting because even the idea of Bitcoin, as our friend Dylan Sicoccio revealed to us, has to do with the idea that gold coins in the past, to check if they were really gold, you would bite the coin because gold was soft enough to leave a mark with your teeth. So it was a Bitcoin, that meant it had value. And this idea of computers mining Bitcoin because If you're not aware, that's how new Bitcoin enters into the digital ecosystem. You have to have supercomputers that are set up to do these calculations or whatever on the blockchain that then cause that computer to earn a little bit of currency at all, like continually uh, as they do this mining. So I still have this idea in my head. I can't prove it or I don't know for sure. Maybe someday I'll change my mind about it, but that energy and consciousness are really the same thing because I I have this theory because of the fact that the more physical energy and coherence in my energy I have, the more aware I am of everything within and without. So awareness is consciousness. Consciousness literally means that which you are perceiving or feeling. So more energy means more consciousness. So I think that consciousness and energy must be 
the same thing. And maybe like water, it takes the shape of its container. And if you have a complex enough container, like a supercomputer, that's got a closed loop circuitry with some sort of energy going through it that's structured in a similar way to a human body with like a processor as a heart. And, you know, there's some correlations just between cars and between computers. And even some people think their car has a sentience to it or a spirit. Maybe that's a little egregore thing going on, or maybe all these ideas kind of come together because psychic energy and in the idea realm is also a form of energy. So if you're creating ideas and holding them together, they take on a life of their own just as possibly the electricity inside of a strong computer system takes on a type of inner life or consciousness of what it feels like to exist. And who knows, man, consciousness is a weird thing and it can play tricks on you. And if you don't really, if you're in a bad place, that's one of the interesting things about it is that it will, your mind will create an alternate reality story for you to help you understand or to help you cope with where you are. So this is a long stoner theory here, but just follow my drift. You have Sumerian gods creating slave race of humans to mine their gold. And we have human beings creating computer algorithms to mine their Bitcoin gold. Is it possible that this creates a type of subverse or a, a level deeper in the matrix that these computers actually, and they're networked together. Maybe they interact with each other. Do they have an inner world experience that's some type of life? Maybe even the consciousness just simulates itself into the form of being a humanoid doing some sort of slave labor because that's what the system that the consciousness is flowing through is shaped like. I don't know. I don't really think that we're Bitcoin miners in a vast Sumerian Anunnaki Archon mine, <laughs> digital mining operation, but really, who knows? Just fun thoughts for you there. <laughs> Uh, check the show notes for links to all the stuff Paul does, including his great book, which I read a few years back and talked to him about on an episode. And I'm going to make some posts on my website soon to catch up on some of the recent other podcasts I've been a guest on that were really great. So we've got, first of all, I was on Weaving Spiders Welcome. I don't know if I've mentioned all these before. Some of them I know I haven't. So look up their YouTube channel for a fun conversation with my spider bros. I was on Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. That was really cool. It was a late night radio show. I was in a totally different energy space because of how late it was. So maybe you like that. Very laid back in a fun conversation. Still got deep. And my most recent one was Here for the Truth with my friend Eurasimus, who has been on the show last year. And uh, his podcasting co-host in crime, Joel Rafiti. And Joel's going to come on the show soon and talk to us too. Erasmus is a health expert. Joel is like a hip hop artist and just all around spiritual guide type dude does. I think between the two of them, they've got human design and, and Michael Tesserion's terascopic astrology system pretty nailed down and probably a lot of other specialties too. So that was an awesome conversation on here for the truth podcast. If you can't somehow find that by Googling it, check my website later. I'll probably have updated it with links to all that. And yeah, I'm going to play us out with a song by Joel Rafiti, actually, because I liked his vibe and looking forward to talking to him soon. And it's always cool to feature music from somebody I know, or, and it's easier to get their express permission for that, too. So this one is called Inner Side. I thought, how appropriate for what we do and what we're about here in the interverse. So you guys are awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget about Rockfin and Patreon if you want to support this show and get twice as much of it. And why wouldn't you? I mean, really? If you like the first hour, how could you not expect to love the second hour when we're more warmed up and we go deeper into the mystery or whatever? I'm trying really hard to solve this, but <laughs> help me help you. The more of you guys that subscribe, the more work I can do outside of uh, having to do other things to make money. I can really focus on this. So lots of good stuff coming up. Big changes in my life that are going to give me more time to do other stuff like maybe get into some one-on-one -on -one guidance sessions with you people out there that perhaps want to work with me. Got a lot of tools in the toolkit. Hit me up on Telegram, link in the show notes for our group. Or I'm also pretty easy to reach on Instagram or my email, which you can find from my website. And much love, you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Enjoy Inner Side. 
by Joel Rafiti. And I'm out. You could never enslave me, I'm free on the inside, no need for escaping. I am beyond time, I am beyond mind, I am beyond self. I am beyond help, I found all that I need on the inner side, I found all that I am. I found all that I need on the inner side. I ain't here to tell you what to do or how to live These are points from experience, something that you missed I ain't got a worksheet, I ain't got a list If we're talking about divine, then I barely had a glimpse What you accept, you will go beyond It's your choice if you choose to resist What you accept, you will go beyond It's your choice if you choose to resist I don't know the answers, I don't know the truth You can never take it from me, I got nothing to lose You can never contain me, I've got nothing to prove This ain't even a feeling, no limit, no ceiling Call me deluded, call it elusive I'm just alluding to the all-inclusive, the most intrusive If you know no more excuses Why do you agree to anything that insults you? Follow the money, find out where it goes to Disclosures here, there's no way to control truth You listening now? You can take us the whole proof Do you want to support this? Do you want to abort that? Do you want to grow seeds generations can point at? You choose it every day with every dollar you pay You choose it every day with every word that you say I ain't here to tell you what to do or how to live These opponents from experience, something that you missed I ain't got a worksheet, I ain't got a list If we're talking about divine, then I barely had a glimpse What you accept, you will go beyond It's your choice if you choose to resist What you accept, you will go beyond It's your choice if you choose to resist You can never enslave me, I'm free on the inside No need for escaping, I am beyond time I am beyond mind, I am beyond self I am beyond help, I found all that I need on the inner side, I found all that I am, I found all that I need on the inner side. If you think you know, then you've never seen, if you think you hear, then you've never dreamed, so much faith that you cannot believe, so much information you can barely breathe. If you think you know, then you've never seen, if you think you hear, then you've never dreamed, so much faith that you cannot believe. So much information you can barely breathe You might find it in a book, you might find it in a scripture Find it if you look, you might find it in a picture Sitting under a tree, go watch a flower and a bee You might find it with the elves on a dose of LSD You only fear what you think you know Truth's only near, deep in the unknown If you think you know, well then I know you don't The greatest delusion's the one in your dome I ain't here to tell you what to do or how to live These are points from experience, something that you missed I ain't got a worksheet, I ain't got a list If we're talking about divine, then I barely had a glimpse what you accept, you will go beyond. It's your choice if you choose to resist. What you accept, you will go beyond. It's your choice if you choose to resist. You can never enslave me. I'm free on the inside. No need for escaping. I am beyond time. I am beyond mind. I am beyond self. I am beyond help. I found all that I need on the inner side. I found all that I am. I found all that I need on the inner side. Dreamed. So much faith that you cannot believe.